If you've been following the news over the last few years, chances are you've heard of drug kingpin Joaquin Archibaldo Guzman, better known as El Chapo. Much in the mold of notorious gangsters like Pablo Escobar, El Chapo moved millions of kilos of drugs around Central America and almost got away with it. Though his path of violence made him many enemies, El Chapo remained in power despite the odds. He escaped from high-security Mexican prisons twice, only to fall into the hands of the American government. El Chapo was recently sentenced to life in a super-maximum prison in Florence, Colorado. Today we're exploring El Chapo's new life behind bars, his fellow inmates, and the life of crime that led him to his current incarceration. First, let's look at his recent conviction. The hearings ended after a three-month drug trial in New York that exposed the inner workings of his sprawling cartel, which over decades shipped tons of drugs into the United States and plagued Mexico with relentless bloodshed and corruption. As Judge Brian M. Kogan read the jury's charge sheet in open court, 10 straight guilty verdicts on all 10 counts of the indictment, Mr. Guzman sat listening to the translator looking stunned. When the reading of the verdict was complete, Mr. Guzman leaned back to glance at his wife, Emma Coronel Iceboro, who flashed him a thumbs up with tears in her eyes. The the jury's decision came more than a week after the panel started deliberations at the trial in Federal District Court in Brooklyn, where prosecutors presented a mountain of evidence against the cartel leader, including testimony from 56 witnesses, 14 of whom once worked with Mr. Guzman. Mr. Guzman's trial, which took place under intense media scrutiny and tight security from bomb-sniffing dogs, police snipers, and federal marshals with radiation sensors, was the first time an American jury heard details about the financing, logistics, and bloody history of one of the drug cartels that have long pumped huge amounts of heroin, cocaine, marijuana, and synthetic drugs like fentanyl into the United States, earning traffickers billions of dollars. But despite extensive testimony about private jets filled with cash, bodies burned in bonfires, and shocking evidence that Mr. Guzman and his men often drugged and raped young girls, the case also revealed the operatic, even absurd nature of cartel culture. It featured accounts of traffickers taking target practice with a bazooka, a mariachi playing all night outside a jail cell, and a murder plot involving a cyanide-laced arepa. At times, the trial was so bizarre it felt like a drug world telenovela unfolding live in the courtroom. Last month, one of Mr. Guzman's mistresses tearfully proclaimed her love for him even as she testified against him. The following day, in what seemed like a coordinated show of solidarity, the kingpin and his wife, Emma Coronel Asperro, appeared in court in matching red velvet smoking jackets. But regardless of this show of solidarity, El Chapo had a bad reputation and he was destined to receive a guilty verdict. Now he's being shipped off to a supermax prison in Colorado, and his future is not looking very bright. His time in prison will be extremely uncomfortable. For one thing, he will be subjected to a policy known as 23-in-1, which means he will be in his cell for 23 hours a day and outside for a single hour. To make things even more miserable, for the one hour of outdoor time, the inmates are shackled and held in an enclosure barely larger than their cell. This particular prison has been described as a high-tech version of hell, and it holds some of the nation's most dangerous criminals. The prison, also called the Alcatraz of the Rockies, is surrounded by razor wire fences, gun towers, heavily armored patrols, and attack dogs. Snipers guard the grounds and gun towers. No inmate has ever escaped the prison. Inmates spend about 23 hours of every day in solitary confinement inside a 12 by 7 foot cell made of concrete with a small window. The room is designed so that inmates cannot have contact with others or much of the outside world. Some prisoners are allowed a small black and white TV, but El Chapo will be unable to catch up on Narcos on Netflix. It only shows carefully chosen educational and religious programs. Each cell has a slit-like 42-inch tall, 4-inch wide window which is angled to prevent views of the sky. You're designing it so the inmates can't see the sky, intentionally, former Supermax prison warden Robert Hood told CNN. You're putting up wires so helicopters can't land. Each cell contains a toilet, shower, and bed, which is constituted by a concrete slab with a thin mattress. Meals are slid through openings in the doors. This place is not designed for humanity. It's not designed for rehabilitation, said a guard familiar with the facility. Travis Dusenberry, who spent 10 years locked up in the prison, told Vice that the only contact he had with people was if his neighbor's schedule lined up with his. The closest human contact you could get was what we called finger handshakes through the fence, Dusenberry said. And to make sure inmates don't talk to each other, cell walls are soundproofed. Prisoners often go days, even weeks, with only a few words spoken to them, an Amnesty International report found. This total lack of human contact is enough to make anyone lose their mind. But of course, the comfort of these prisoners is not a priority. And should an inmate need a doctor, they must talk to them remotely through teleconferencing. Former warden Robert Hood has described the Supermax as life after death, adding it's far worse than death. Commonly, it is known as the prison of prisons, and human rights groups claim it's even worse than Guantanamo. 
So who exactly will El Chapo be rubbing elbows with at this supermax facility? It turns out that most of the big names in crime and terrorism reside here. These include the leaders of violent gangs who had continued to issue orders to their members from lower security facilities, Larry Hoover of the Gangster Disciples and Tyler Bingham of the Aryan Brotherhood. The prison also houses foreign terrorists, including Zacharias Musao, the only person convicted in civilian court of the September 11th attacks, Faisal Shahzad, the perpetrator of the 2010 Times Square car bombing attempt, and Ramzi Youssef, mastermind of the 1993 World Trade Center bombing, as well as domestic terrorists such as Ted Kaczynski and Eric Rudolph. Timothy McVeigh, who carried out the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing, was housed at the Supermax before he was sentenced to death in 1997 and transferred to the United States Penitentiary Terre Haute, which houses most federal death row inmates and is where federal death sentences are carried out. McVeigh's co-conspirator Terry Nichols is serving 161 life sentences at the prison. Robert Hansen, the former FBI agent who betrayed several spies to the Soviet Union and Russia, is serving 15 life sentences at the Supermax for his crimes. Dokar Sarnev, the perpetrator of the Boston Marathon bombings, was transferred here from another prison in the Forens Complex on July 17, 2015. The prison also houses inmates who are a high escape risk, including Richard McNair, who escaped from a county jail and two other prisons before being sent to the facility. However, the majority of inmates have been sent there because they have an extensive history of committing violent crimes against correction officers and fellow inmates in other prisons, up to and including murder. Their diet is restricted to ensure that the foods they are served in their cell cannot be used to harm themselves or to create unhygienic conditions in their cell. Certainly, this will be a drastic change from the billionaire playboy lifestyle that El Chapo was accustomed to. In order to give a clearer idea of this wild contrast, let's explore his life before he was convicted. Joaquin Arquivaldo Guzman Loera was born into a poor family in the rural community of Latuna, Mexico on April 4, 1957. His father was officially a cattle rancher, as were most in the area where he grew up. According to some sources, however, he might also have been a Gomero, an opium poppy farmer. As a child, he sold oranges and dropped out of school in third grade to work with his father. He was regularly beaten, and he sometimes fled to his maternal grandmother's house to escape such treatment. However, he stood up to his father to protect his younger siblings from being beaten. When he was a teenager, his father kicked him out of the house, and he went to live with his grandfather. It was during his adolescence that Guzman gained the nickname El Chapo, Mexican slang for shorty, for his 5 foot 6 inch stature and stocky physique. El Chapo didn't appreciate being belittled, however, and he made it his mission to be taken seriously by his community. Many even believe that he had some form of Napoleon complex. By the late 1970s, Guzman had proven his value in the narcotics business and begun working with another rising young dealer named Hector Luis Palma Salazar. Guzman oversaw the movement of drugs from his home district of Sinaloa, a crucial drug trafficking area on the western end of Mexico, where narcotics flowed north to coastal cities and into the United States. By his late 20s, the quiet but savvy Guzman was supervising logistics for another drug kingpin, Miguel Angel Felix Gallardo, founder of the Guadalajara cartel. Guzman kept a low profile, but when his boss was eventually arrested for the 1985 murder of an American DEA agent, he quickly emerged as one of the new faces of the Mexican drug world. Inheriting some of his former boss's territory, Guzman founded his own cartel, known as Sinaloa, in 1989. By the early 1990s, Guzman was on the radar of the DEA and FBI and was considered one of Mexico's most powerful and dangerous drug traffickers. As the power of the Colombian drug cartels began to wane, Sinaloa was among the Mexican organizations filling the void. Under Guzman's direction, it took control of the cocaine trade extending from South America to the United States. Part of the success stemmed from Sinaloa's creative smuggling methods, most notably a series of air-conditioned tunnels that ran under the Mexican-U.S. border. Another method involved hiding cocaine powder inside fire extinguishers and cans that were labeled chili peppers. In addition to cocaine, Sinaloa trafficked heroin, marijuana, and methamphetamine into the U.S. and beyond. Eventually, the cartel's tentacles touched five continents and grew to be the biggest drug operation in the world. Guzman coupled that success with serious muscle. He established gangs with names such as Los Chachos, Los Texas, Los Lobos, and Los Negros to protect his empire. Over the years, Guzman's men have been accused of committing more than 1,000 murders throughout Mexico, the casualties including both incompetent henchmen and rival bosses. In 1993, Guatemalan authorities arrested Guzman and extradited him to Mexico, where he was convicted and sentenced to a maximum security prison for 20 years. Even behind bars, however, Guzman maintained his power. Through bribes, he arranged for conjugal visits and was largely allowed to run his drug operation. With his near-mythical lore already established in Mexico, many villages in his home district saw Guzman as a Robin Hood-like figure. His legend grew in 2001, when with the help of bribed prison guards, he escaped prison via a laundry cart.
A federal investigation led to the arrest of 71 prison employees, including the warden. In February 2014, Guzman was finally apprehended in a hotel in the Pacific Beach town of Mazatlan, Mexico. Declining requests by American officials to have Guzman extradited to the United States, Mexican President Enrique Peña Nieto vowed that Guzman wouldn't escape again. Yet less than 18 months later, Guzman orchestrated a second daring flight from prison in July 2015. For this escape, Guzman slipped through an opening in his cell's shower section, made his way down a 30-foot ladder, and then traveled through a tunnel network that connected his cell to a house that was still under construction about a mile away. On October 17, 2015, Guzman was reportedly injured in his face and leg when escaping a failed military manhunt to capture him in the mountains of northwest Mexico. Around that same time, unbeknownst to the rest of the world, he conducted a secret interview with American actor Sean Penn. Guzman wanted to make a movie about his life and managed to connect with Penn via Mexican actress Kate Castillo. On January 8, 2016, Mexican President Enrique Peña Nieto announced on Twitter that Mexican authorities had recaptured Guzman after a shootout earlier that morning in the city of Los Mochis. Mission accomplished, the president wrote. We have him. Even after his capture, little is known about the man who claimed to have killed 2,000 to 3,000 people in his lifetime. The cold-blooded killer is only semi-literate after receiving only a third-grade education, but that doesn't mean he isn't a highly competent criminal who outsmarted authorities for decades. But one thing remains certain. To escape from this supermax prison a third time would be absolutely unthinkable. Then again, he has pulled out the impossible before. In the eyes of prosecutors, his conviction is a huge victory, but most experts believe it hardly made a dent in the Pan-American drug trade. In fact, many believe that the problem will not dissipate until Americans address their drug use rather than criminalizing those who facilitate it.